As plant parents, we intuitively understand that gardening is therapy, plant care is self-care, and the multitude of other plants and wellness-inspired sayings, right? That we've all come to embody. I mean, I wrote a whole book on this topic. But did you know that there is a practice being used in hospitals, retirement homes, correctional facilities, using plants as a means of healing, empowerment, and even as a vocation? Horticultural therapy, also known as therapeutic horticulture, has received a lot of attention in the last year as registered horticultural therapists have been changing the concept of what healing can look like. I recently took a class on therapeutic horticulture for mental health with the New York Botanical Garden, and I fell in love with my wise, sensitive, and very interesting teacher, Hilda Cruz. In addition to teaching therapeutic horticulture at the New York Botanical Garden, Hilda is also the director of horticultural therapy with the Horticultural Society of New York. And with the society, she has worked at Rikers Island, New York's largest and probably most famous jail, through the Hort Society of New York for decades. Today, we explore the healing modality, the power of therapeutic horticulture. Welcome to the Growing Joy podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives. I'm Maria, author of Growing Joy, the Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, an epic plant killer turned happy plant lady. On Growing Joy, you'll find conversations about plant care, plant community, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Plant friends, welcome back. Happy spring. I've placed my transplants orders with Territorial Seed Company for my balcony garden. I'm doing grow bags again this year. My house plants are starting to grow. My Monstera has a big, juicy, fenestrated leaf that is unfurling. It's right next to my Peloton that I ride, I work out on in the morning. So it like sits with me and cheers me on as I work out. I also hung two bird feeders outside of my office window, and I am getting so many different birds at my office window. It's actually something, it's a practice I talk about in my book, but it's so fun to be seeing birds all the time. Just it's a it's a way to get my eyes off of my screen and out my window to connect with nature for a few minutes. Anyway, spring has sprung. I hope you're feeling it too if you're in the northern hemisphere. I wanted to give a quick shout out to Katie H, Vicky Ross, Disa L, and Brittany H. These are four listeners who have recently joined our community platform and app. It's called the Growing Joy Garden Society. It's the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. It's a platform if you want to access it via your computer. It's an app for iOS and Android. We've got the most amazing newsfeed of posts from international members of our communities about houseplants, gardening, planty DIY. There's a plant entrepreneurship group. Uh, We've got monthly calls. It's the coolest place ever. If you're interested in joining us, join us at jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. All right, into this episode. Holy moly, plant friends. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you'll know that I have dove deeper into my plant care education through taking online and in-person classes with New York Botanical Garden. I started in 2020, I think. Since then, I've taken their Soil Science 101, Plant Science 101, the Science of Tree Communication, and Introduction to Horticultural Therapy. Having lived in New York City for a decade, I was so lucky that I could just hop on the train to get to one of the most amazing botanical gardens in the country. It is so magical over there. But in the pandemic, they moved their education online, and I felt like I was able to benefit even more because the courses were digital. So this January, I took my newest class called Therapeutic Horticulture for Mental Health, as this topic is near and dear to my heart. Plants were a huge part of me healing my personal depression. I'm so inspired by the practice of horticultural therapy. I mean, I wrote a whole freaking book on how to use plants to live a happier life. (laughs) If you don't know, the book is called Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness. It's available anywhere books are sold. But anyway, my class on therapeutic horticulture for mental health led by Hilda Cruz was way different than I was expecting. Through the New York Botanical Garden's reconceptualized therapeutic horticulture certificate program, which is different than horticultural therapist which we'll learn in the episode today. Students can prepare for a multitude of career pathways by using plants and gardening as a therapeutic modality. All of the courses in the Therapeutic Horticultural Certificate Program offer education to learn how to utilize nature to empower individuals and groups whose lives have been affected by illnesses, injuries, disabilities, and life circumstances in order to achieve improvements in their cognitive, physical, social, emotional, and spiritual well-being. 
This course was really eye-opening. It was a hybrid course, so I took most of it online, and then we had one day at the garden all together. All of my classmates were part of the certification program, so I was the only one taking it just out of curiosity for the subject matter. We got a lot of data and science-backed methods to apply to our own therapeutic practices. We did hands-on activities. We had tests. We had homework. (laughs) And it accumulated in this beautiful day at the garden where we had a class long assignment to create our own miniature therapeutic gardens, whatever that meant to us. So throughout the six week course, we were all working on our own therapeutic gardens. We brought them to New York Botanical Garden and the presentations left me teary eyed. So many of these presentations and these gardens were created rooted in the human experience, rooted in deep desire to help people heal, grow, uh, bloom, grow, for lack of a better word. And I just felt like the presentations kind of projected what the future could look like. I hope that we have a world in the future where every hospital, every correctional facility, every retirement home has programs like this because the work works. And Hilda, our guest today, is going to speak more to that. If you're interested in potentially taking therapeutic horticulture classes at New York Botanical Garden, you can go to nybg.org slash learn, then click adult education and certificate programs and click therapeutic horticulture. There's a direct link to the program in the show notes as well. It's just too long for me to say. And if you're interested, there are a couple of classes that are certificate level that are coming up. So they have a Fundamentals of Gardening class that starts on May 17th, and they have an Intro to Plant Science that starts April 28th or May 12th. I've taken both of these classes, and they're great. I especially really liked the Intro to Plant Science. So therapeutic horticulture, we've set the stage. Today's episode, you might have noticed, it's specifically regarding horticultural therapy at Rikers Island, New York's largest and most likely famous, most famous jail. When I learned that Hilda, my sweet, soft-spoken teacher with bright orange hair, has led the horticultural therapy program there for almost two decades, I knew I needed to know more. So today's episode is going to be all about therapeutic horticulture, but through a very specific lens in correctional facilities. It's very inspiring. Let me know if you enjoyed this episode and exploration of therapeutic horticulture, because I could totally see turning this into a whole series where we look at different populations in need and how therapeutic horticulture can be used to serve those populations. So without further ado, here's Hilda. Welcome to Growing Joy. Thank you very much. It's so exciting being here, Maria. This is wonderful, and I appreciate you inviting me and letting me speak today. You've been my teacher at New York Botanical Garden, and I'm so excited to introduce you to my audience for two reasons. Number one, the work you've done, your story. I'm so excited to share just you and the work and your devotion to this to this work. But also, you have the most amazing voice and the most amazing accent. And every time we were in class, I was always so tickled by your accent and your just beautifully soothing voice. It's like perfect for podcasting. So I, I'm so excited that my audience gets to hear, <laughs> hear your accent. Do you want to introduce yourself and just say, obviously, where you're from and also your journey to becoming the therapeutic horticulture expert that you are now? So my name is Hilda Cruz. And my real name is Mechthild. And I'm saying this in this podcast because I'm also, you mentioned my accent. My accent is German. I come from a village near Ulm in the south of Germany and live in the States now since nearly 20 years. And if I think of my journey into horticultural therapy, I have to start in Germany In my parents' garden, actually, I was really, really fortunate to grow up with gardening, as did many of my peers, and it was so normal for us. We didn't think it was unusual. So my my parents had a garden. They grew up with gardens also and grew vegetables to feed their parents. My grandparents grew vegetables to feed their families. And so this tradition was continued, and we had food in the garden, but we also had ornamentals. My father was a rose lover, and Mm. he passed that love on to me. I could speak very lengthily about roses and ornamentals also. That's a great passion of mine. And throughout my youth and then early adulthood, there were many moments where I thought, 
horticulture is beautiful. I enjoy it. I didn't envision it as a profession at that time, but I experienced moments where I thought maybe there is more to it. And one of them was my background is social work. And in a place where I worked in Germany for children who came for medical treatment uh, to Germany and who had severe injuries and needed to learn to use their body again, I started a small garden with them. And we realized how beautiful it was for all of us. And I saw how good it was for the children in this facility to practice moving and using their body and not be confined so much to um, new body shapes they had or situations they had. And so that was my first contact. And I didn't know yet that there is a name for all of this. And then I also experienced a little later in my late 20s when my father got very ill, that gardening continued to be something that we really connect over. We spent, until it wasn't possible for him anymore, we did spend time in the garden and eventually he sat and I worked and it was something that connected us until his end. And that stayed with me as something that could also be a connection between people in this way. And I then had my own little apartment and experienced stressful situations at work. I was outside in the garden. I installed a, a streamer light. I was outside in the garden nearly till midnight sometimes just to have some time outside. Yeah, to decompress. Yeah, and so these are examples of me experiencing therapeutic benefits of horticulture prior to reading about it as a profession. And then came this moment that many of us have where we read about or hear about therapeutic horticulture and horticultural therapy as a profession. Mm-hmm. And that happened to me. My mother sent me an article about for therapy with older adults. And I cut the article out and put it in my memory box on the table because it wasn't the right moment when, when I got the article and pulled it out a little, maybe a year or two later and thought, now is the time where I want to add something to my profession and want to explore this. And this was then my entry into exploring where I can learn that. And I came to the States to learn about it because at the time, this was 2003, we didn't have uh, learning opportunities yet in Germany for this profession, which has changed in the meantime, but at the time we didn't. And so I came to the States to learn about this and add to my profession as social work. And this was relatively in a nutshell how I got to, to this field. And as a child, I would have never thought that because I grew up my maybe my first 12 years watering and collecting slugs from my mother's letters and didn't think this would be something I enjoy so much at a time and utilize in a therapeutic way. And so from then to now has been a lot of experiencing of what gardens can do and plants can do for us. I hear so much universal experience in your story. So many people have that memory of growing up in your parents' garden or for me in my grandparents' garden. Similarly, my grandparents were immigrants from Italy and they had two plots of land. They had a plot of land for their house and then they had the next plot of land next to the house for their garden and they grew all their own food in Queens, New York. And also that experience of late life bonding as a means of connecting to a different generation. And it's interesting because I think intuitively, so many of us understand the concept of therapeutic horticulture, horticultural therapy. You know, outdoor gardeners say, my garden is my therapy. Indoor plant parents say, plant care is self-care. The minute you start connecting with a plant, you have this intuitive connection And it is very interesting that you mentioned, you know, you had to come to the States to get your training, but now it's changed because I think it was like episode 40. So it must have been in 2017, 2018 on therapeutic horticulture. And even from 2018 to now, it feels like 
it has made leaps and bounds. This practice has made leaps and bounds just in cultural awareness, having programs in hospitals and, you know, jails and correctional facilities and retirement homes and hospice, like all of this. It feels like all of a sudden everybody knows about it when, you know, back then I had never heard about it before and got connected with someone at the Chicago Botanic. So it's super interesting. So where did you come to study? In New York? Yes, I came to a small school called Way to Grow, which no longer exists. It, it We were the last course my teacher taught. She was a, a, hortica, a long-standing horticultural therapist who had built a school near Saratoga Springs. But because she had also worked in the city, School, the school blocks, this was a block course, like an intensive course. And the school blocks took place upstate New York, and our internships were down here in the city, where she also had an apartment. She worked with a lot of practitioners around Saratoga Springs, who also taught us. So that was my school entry into, into it. And at the time, the Entryway was slightly different. Over these last 20 years, AHTA has worked a lot on trainings and ed pathways of education into the field. And at the time, because I had a social work uh, background and have worked in social work, my entryway was slightly different. Nowadays, such prior trainings or, or schools also are facilitated into our education. And when I came in, it was as well. And so the way training looked at the time is was quite different than it is now. It's interesting at our New York Botanical Garden class that I just took with you, I was one of the only people that wasn't a social worker in our class. Like it, I, I thought it was very interesting that there were so many people who have degrees in social work Gardening was their hobby, and now they're looking to kind of add a tool to their toolkit or completely switch over. So let's talk a little bit about that. So you hear horticultural therapy, and you hear therapeutic horticulture. Are they the same? Are they different? Is this a license? Is this a doctorate? Like, what is this field? And I know that it's developing. But right now, at this timestamp of spring 2023, what is this field? This is a big question. I was actually excited thinking this through. And I'm going to do something which I don't usually do. I thought, how do I work with, how do I want to think of, of this field and of this question? And I'm going to utilize AHDA's definition as a base for my answer, because I think... And what is AHDA? Okay, so AHDA is the American Horticultural Therapy Association which is kind of our umbrella, just like other fields of professions also have a professional organization, so, so do we. And even though it's still a relatively small profession, we're growing. And Maria, you just mentioned the growing interest even in the last three years. I experienced that too in the field. So it is a growing profession, and AHTA is the national organization. And then there is also an opportunity nationwide to find individual regional networking groups. Here in this area, we have the Mid-Atlantic Core Therapy Networking Group as well as the Northeastern one. So there's a little bit of an overlap, but AHDA is the national organization and is also the organization where pathways into the profession are discussed or their schools that teach horticultural therapy would um, get accredited. And AHDA sets professional standards. There is currently no licensing, but this is no official licensing that's also recognized by the Bureau of Labor. This is something AHDA is working on very hard. And in the course of all that, there's also thoughts about definitions and how all of this gets sorted. And you just mentioned, what is it even? What is when we say the garden is my therapy and, and hobby gardeners say that also, what makes it different from 
an actual form of therapy that's practiced them there. And all of these things are what is thought through by many practitioners. And so I want to start with AHTA's definition, not as a kind of a cop-out for me not to having to say that, but because I think it's important to say this is not random and it's not my decision what I call therapeutic or whole therapy. It is something that's defined as a base for a profession. And that also would mean that if an organization or a facility is hiring the services of a therapeutic horticulture professional or a whole therapist, they would know that this person has received some training and there are shared professional standards for this. And that's why I think this is very important. I often experience still when I say I'm a horticultural therapist, slight confusion, and it sounds like a very soft profession and something that's hard to grasp. And so I do think it's important that we define what we are doing. So with the with AHTA, the definition for horticultural therapy is Core therapy is the participation in horticultural activities facilitated by a registered horticultural therapist to achieve specific goals within an established treatment, rehabilitation, or vocational plan. Horticultural therapy is an active process which occurs in the context of an established treatment plan, where the process itself is considered the therapeutic activity rather than the end product. So this is therapy. And now, as contrast, I'm going to read therapeutic horticulture. Therapeutic horticulture is the participation in horticultural activities facilitated by a registered horticultural therapist or other professionals with training in the use of horticulture as therapeutic modality to support program goals. Therapeutic horticulture is the process through which participants enhance their well-being through active or passive involvement in plant and plant-related activities. And so there is a subtle difference. These are the two core definitions. I think there is a subtle dif difference. And to me, it matters very much that therapeutic horticulture doesn't necessarily have to be facilitated by a person who's a registered or a therapist, which is a the current voluntary registration process through AHTA. But it can also be facilitated by people who took courses. I think it's important that these courses are serious and based on a clear understanding of the profession. And one of them, of course, is our example from NYBG, which is NYBG is a worldwide recognized training and education institution. And so the courses offered at NYBG are a great example for me how individuals from all routes of life could receive relevant training that well equips them to work as therapeutic horticulture facilitators. And so there is a bit of a difference. I think one other difference is also that Horticultural therapy has established treatment plans and works within this treatment plan also very clearly geared towards outcome and measurable outcome, whereas therapeutic horticulture is a little bit wider in its opportunities. Yeah, it feels like therapeutic horticulture is a little bit looser in terms of a little bit more lenient maybe in terms of it's like, could I go do a therapeutic horticulture class probably, but I'm not a horticultural therapist. It's worth noting, you know, I had taken the intro to hort therapy class at NYBG a couple of years ago thinking, oh, maybe I want to go get certified. You know, I want to go get registered. It's rigorous. It's a very intense going through it at NYBG plus, I don't know if they're volunteer hours or they're like apprentice hours. So it's very rigorous. 
So we are in the full swing of spring right now, and that means the growing season is here, which is super exciting, but it also means the travel season is here. We've all got weddings. We've all got summer travel. We've all got time off. I love traveling. I love connecting with family and friends and exploring. But an undesirable side effect of traveling can be the extreme bloat (laughs) that sets on after too many indulgent meals, not being in control of the food that you're eating, or if you're like me, just like drinking too many pina coladas on vacation, because that's my jam. I am so thankful for Saqqara's delicious, nutritional, plant-based meals that are the perfect reset after a season of travel. If you don't know who they are, Saqqara my new favorite meal delivery system, they deliver science-backed, plant-rich nutritional programs and wellness essentials right to your door. Their ready-to-eat meals are nutritionally designed to deliver results from weight management and eased bloat to boosted energy and clearer skin. I just finished the three-day program. I was traveling for three and a half weeks. I came home. I timed my three-day program to happen right when I got home. Plant friends, the meals are so freaking good. Every meal was more delicious than the last. I was shocked. I signed up for the program because I knew that I just wanted to like kind of give my body a reset as I shifted back to a more healthy eating lifestyle, but I loved the food. And I really have to say after just a three-day program, I really felt a difference. It felt so nice to give my body the nutrients it wanted and needed after just like feeling like my pants didn't fit anymore. That three-day program was a great opportunity also to reset my palate, my body, and yeah, my body feels lighter, my clothes fit a little bit better. Honestly, the most important and the most um, impressive side effect of the program is that my spirit feels lighter. It's wild what three days of clean eating will do for your mental health. So if you're looking for a healthy eating kickstart, I can't recommend Saqqara's delicious meals and programs enough. And right now... Plant friends, listen up. Sakara is offering our listeners 20% off their first order when you go to sakara.com slash growing joy and enter code growing joy at checkout. That's sakara, S A K A R A dot com slash growing joy to get 20% off your first order. Sakara.com slash growing joy. Okay, so I am always on the hunt for new podcasts to listen to, and I figured if you're listening to this podcast, you might be too. So if you're looking for another show that nourishes your soul, then you have to check out No Small Endeavor, produced by my friends at Great Feeling Studios and PRX. No Small Endeavor explores what it means to live meaningfully just like this show. In each episode, award-winning professor and host Lee C. Camp brings you thoughtful conversations with artists, philosophers, and theologians like The Office actor Rain Wilson and West Wing's Michael Sheen about what it means to truly flourish. If you need a place to start, I highly recommend their recent episode with New York Times bestselling author Gretchen Rubin. The conversation is all about what it takes to be happy day by day. So go ahead, plant friend. Go follow No Small Endeavor on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and tell them I sent you. That's no small endeavor. Therapeutic horticulture is kind of something we practice in our own homes. And I want to just give a shout out to the New York Botanical Garden right now on making understanding therapeutic horticulture way more accessible than I think it has been in the past. It's so cool that the program, the Therapeutic Horticulture Program at NYBG has so many different people from so many different walks of life that have this interest in learning more about therapeutic horticulture in order to bring this incredible knowledge that we're about to talk to to their communities. It's just It's so moving and I think, you know, it's something that we all kind of intrinsically understand in ourselves, but we do need some training and practice to really be able to go and apply it. And even for me, someone who wrote a book about the power of plants, you know, it deepened my experience of understanding the the true power of therapeutic horticulture and giving me more tools in my toolbox. Um, And I just wanted to say, I just, I love the New York Botanical Garden Education Program so much. I feel so lucky that I've been able to take so many courses with them and highly encourage everyone, no matter what you do professionally, to try out a course. But something that really blew me away in your class was how intentional 
the plans are and the goals and the objectives. And, you know, there was the most fascinating worksheet you gave us that had different mental diagnoses like ADHD or depression or anxiety or bipolar and different therapeutic horticulture practices that you would quote unquote prescribe based on the different diagnoses that you're working with. Like this is, it's very, it's not just like go in the garden and feel better. It's very intentional and thoroughly researched. And I think it's a lot more than what people understand. Right. And I think that's also the really big difference. So sometimes when somebody says to me, it all looks so easy in your gardens and it feels so comfortable and so pleasant, And sometimes people also say, I would love to have your job. This all looks so easy. And I think, no, this is how we make it look. We make it look comfortable. And this is part of us intentionally creating spaces where people who come to the gardens can feel this level of comfort and can feel it is easy. But that's also the work we do. And this is, as you just say, I think the the term intentional is key in all of that and it really it's that's very very important that it's not just us being in a garden that's what I can do for myself I can be in a garden and just let be there and do something and putter about and feel good about it but that's my personal interaction with it the moment I bring it to work with clients or bring other people in for any other reason than just spending free time there, I need to have an understanding of how I can utilize that. And that begins with a clear understanding of plants. It's not enough to say, I think plants are pretty. We need to know enough about plants to be able to utilize them. These are our tools. Really our, I think that's hard skills that we need in this profession to be able to think when I meet this client, maybe this plant would be interesting. Or how can I utilize plants really, really focused with people? And then also to think about goals. I I just shared it also when I read about this. Goals and what our clients, our participants might want to develop. And then we can build a plan utilizing plants as a vehicle. But to me, the term intentional is key there and to have a solid understanding of how I can support a person through these activities. And you mentioned the rigorous training. I think in our course at NYBG, yes, there are really often professionals from the field of either social work or occupational therapy, often nursing. So there is a background and many people already use plants but come to our course to get a clear, clearer understanding and get these tools to work with it in an intentional way. And the difference to then the, the training that's required to become an HTR is that there are college credits required both for human science and then also horticulture to make sure that in both of these fields there is a solid leg to stand on and an understanding And of course, if somebody has worked as an occupational therapist or social worker or teacher for many years, there is already that strong foundation. So more and more nowadays, I see younger people coming in or people who don't have, who are not rooted in any of these fields. Yeah, they've experienced their own. Yes, yes transformation through therapeutic horticulture right. and want to share it. You know, the other thing that I think really blows my mind, especially with you, this is like trauma-informed work. You're working with populations who have really gone through some really tough situations. You're coming from working at Rikers Island for 20 years. I first learned of the therapeutic horticulture program at Rikers in my first NYBG class a couple of years ago, I was fascinated by it. And then the pandemic hit. Can you talk about what brought you to Rikers and what two decades of working in that program has looked like for you, lessons learned? Yes. 
what brought me there was initially my last internship within my course that I took here in the States in 2003. I did not have any experience with people who are incarcerated and had no, yeah, no personal experience with this field. But during my course, I remember I did two internships that were really wonderful. One was in a um, hospital for long-term care and, and rehabilitation. And another one in a garden upstate New York where people with traumatic brain injuries would get therapeutic horticulture classes or workshops. And then I thought this was wonderful and it didn't completely surprise me how effective and how amazing I thought horticultural therapy worked. But I was thinking about, my teacher had told us, Horticultural therapy works everywhere and with everyone. And so I thought, hmm, what is a population where I can't right away imagine how this works or where I'm curious what exactly in the field might be supportive for people? I thought I want to see how this could work in a correctional facility because I couldn't imagine that. And through Google found the program by the Horticultural Society of New York that's on Rikers. And I applied and got an opportunity to do my internship there. And so that's how this happened. At the time, this was not considered a therapeutic horticulture program. It was the focal point was vocational training. And this was also why the program was founded nearly 40 years ago. People from the Horticultural Society of New York and the mayor's office and also the Department of Correction were thinking through how, why the recidivism rate is so high. And one of the aspects of this is that there's very limited job opportunities for people who um, have a record. And horticulture actually is a field where people also with a record might find employment and so this end it's a job where within relatively short time people really can obtain solid skills and this is how horticulture started on Rikers in 1986 very very early on and then so more as a vocational instead of a therapeutic program okay yeah and for many years the vocational and also educational aspects were or really the only explicit goal of the program on Rikers. And when I started my internship there in 2003, I immediately saw, or really immediately felt that this is amazing for people and that this garden, I didn't know what to expect and immediately saw this is a place where a lot of joy is really noticeable right away and excitement and people wanting to learn and connecting with nature. And I saw so many things, even just within my first days. And also realized that all along, the therapeutic aspects were present, but more as a byproduct. Until then, it wasn't explicitly said, this also is a therapeutic horticulture program. And these words weren't utilized in connection with the program. And that's a change... I found very significant to not just quietly enjoy that there is a therapeutic benefit, but to say this program is a therapeutic horticulture program in addition to vocational and educational aspects, because that meant over time we were able to add other um, groups of people to it. And this was also then noticed by the Department of Correction and the Department of Education that's operating schools on, on Rikers. And so as also Rikers changed with more focus on the fact that so many people on Rikers are diagnosed with mental health disorders or experience distress and also so many people come with substance use disorders, therapeutic programs became more relevant. And as we grew into that, 
the DOC recognized, wait, there is this program that we had all along and actually it's therapeutic and they began to listen or hear much more from participants about what this program could do for them. So it, there were many small aspects that fed into the program growing as a therapeutic program on Rikers. And we then began utilizing that. And from then on, I would say from 2005 on, which is when I started working there permanently, we always, always introduced this program as a place that, that does therapeutic horticulture, vocational training and related education. And we have since grown very much. We, When I started, we had two groups of women and men who are sentenced. And that meant everybody had anticipated release date and we knew when they would return to the community. And we are able to start planning for that transition right away with them as they began working with us in the program. In 2008, we added our first group of people who are detainees, which meant they didn't know yet when they would return to the community and they were currently in the process of fighting their cases. And so that was a very different situation. First of all, it was wonderful that we had growth and this growth was based on the DOC and the DOE saying, we want the therapeutic aspects, specifically those from you. And it also meant we had to rethink how we deliver our service. Because if I work with somebody who doesn't know what's in the future and if they might spend a short time on Rikers and then come back to the community, or also if they might spend a certain amount of time, often maybe even decades, in a, in a facility upstate, I need to adjust what I bring to to my participants and how I make it relevant and what their situation is because they do face such different situations and that was a difference for us. I mean, then it becomes more important for a person who doesn't know what happens. It becomes more important to think about and for me to deliver plant activities that support hope and the realization that Life still is, there's so much to discover and a lot to, for our brain also to be activated and to be curious about things to look forward to. I think that's a very relevant aspect for me to focus on things to look forward to. So these were differences. And then over the next couple of years, up until the pandemic, we grew significantly Right when the pandemic started, we had seven groups on Rikers, six. Seven groups of how many people in each group? Varying from typically seven as a smaller size to up to 15 for the bigger sizes. And it, we worked with women and men who always are separate there. And those seven groups had different focal points. We also worked with different age groups up until 2018 when the adolescents got moved off the island our youngest students were 16 17 at that time we still had adolescents and we had a group there in that facility and my oldest participants there they were in their early 70s so the, the age range can be really big and then we also had groups who were uh, specifically under mental observation. And to me, this was a development I found exciting and really testament to the recognition for therapeutic horticulture as an effective modality to support people. And so our groups from housing areas under mental observation were people who might not always be eligible to other programming or yeah, where we then focused, again, focused maybe less on the vocational aspect, depending on individual situation, and more on supporting mental and emotional well-being. 
And so each of those seven groups had a slightly different focal point or angle we were working with. Imagine that beautiful harmony wafting its way through your lawn and garden this year, or better yet, gifting the glorious experience of a Wind River chime to a loved one. So every time they hear it sing, they think of you. Hands down, one of the best things Billy and I ever did for our mindfulness practices in 2023 is hang Wind River chimes on either side of our house. They sing in the wind throughout the day, and every time they do, their melodies are an invitation to stop what we're doing, take a deep breath, and drop back into the present. Not to mention, they just make me smile because they sound so dang pretty. We joke that our house feels like a spa. (laughs) Today, Wind River wants to use their ad time to gift you a mindful moment with their chimes, so please enjoy. Let's take a big breath in, hold it, exhale. Another big breath, hold it, and exhale again. The chimes are so magical, and not only do they sound magical, but the company is magical. The Wind River Chimes is rooted in service. For chimes purchased on windriverchimes.com, they donate 20% of the purchase price to charity each month. 20% to charity. So friends, get yourself or your loved one a chime for your next birthday, your next wedding to celebrate, a memorial, and when you use the code GROWINGJOY at windriverchimes.com, you'll get a free engraving on any engravable wind chime to add a special element to your gift. They come in a variety of colors, sizes, and sounds, so head to windriverchimes.com to listen, and don't forget to use code GROWINGJOY at checkout to receive a free engraving. windriverchimes.com, code GROWINGJOY at checkout. Okay, so I am always on the hunt for new podcasts to listen to, and I figured if you're listening to this podcast, you might be too. So if you're looking for another show that nourishes your soul, then you have to check out No Small Endeavor, produced by my friends at Great Feeling Studios and PRX. No Small Endeavor explores what it means to live meaningfully just like this show. In each episode, award-winning professor and host Lee C. Camp brings you thoughtful conversations with artists, philosophers, and theologians like The Office actor Rain Wilson and West Wing's Michael Sheen about what it means to truly flourish. If you need a place to start, I highly recommend their recent episode with New York Times bestselling author Gretchen Rubin. The conversation is all about what it takes to be happy day by day. So go ahead, plant friend. Go follow No Small Endeavor on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and tell them I sent you. That's no small endeavor. It's really interesting because you've been there for, you know, 19 years. So you've really seen this program blossom, for lack of a better word. What do you think is the most potent vehicle for moving horticultural therapy forward when it comes to government institutions putting money behind these programs? Is it the science and the studies that are proving it? Or do you think that the testimonials from your students are enough? I think it has to be a little bit of it all. I think none of all of this can work without science to prove it. Or when I say science, I mean results, documented results and outcomes to prove it. I think that's very, very important because I can talk all day about the beautiful time we had in the garden and can give example after example. And yet it sounds like, well, there is this friendly woman who likes plants and she tells me these stories. Right, playing in the yes, garden. exactly. It doesn't work like that. I need, Which to... is so sexist too, but whatever, we, we move forward. <laughs> it is, kind of, and that might play into it also, but part of that can come into speaking with people who I want to convince, but I always need to support it also with solid results. And this can happen in form of collecting data, in form of 
We do that since a long time on Rikers in form of questionnaires and feedback and then translating that into things like pie charts. Or, so we, we document very specific aspects. We document stress reduction, mood improvement, anxiety reduction, and skill development. And these are things that we then take from those questionnaires and turn into pie charts or clearly visible outcomes. So I think that's one important thing. And we have started doing this also with the Horticultural Society's other therapeutic horticultural programs in the community. So aside from Rikers, we have programs in supportive housing and also continued opportunities for people who come from correctional facilities and want to further their trainings. And so this too is very important. All of this is important to document. Now, on Rikers, I think you asked about what is the most potent part. I think it's a bit of all of that. It also is, well, correctional facilities are places where when I think about what do people have in common there or what when I work with a person who is incarcerated, what do they have in common? And one thing people there have in common is that they are not there voluntarily. They live with other people they didn't choose to live with. They don't at this moment have control over their movements, over the course of the day within the facility, or also to go outside of the facility. They don't have beautiful environments. By design, it's not beautiful. And they are away from their loved ones. So these are com common things. They also often don't have clarity over what can happen next with their future. And so this is what I would look at. There might be some other things they have in common. Many people on Rikers, um, and we know that also from the paper, do have substance, are diagnosed with um, substance use disorder and or mental health issues. And so this might be a commonality, but I can't assume that everybody who is incarcerated kind of is the same. People are individuals. We have people of all ages, all routes of life, all levels of education. People who are who have been homeless before coming to Rikers, other people who have lived with families. They might be siblings, brothers, fathers, mothers. They might also be grandparents. So I meet people really from all walks of life. But what I mentioned earlier, these factors they have in common is something I then work with. And gardens, of course, have unbelievable opportunities starting with beauty. I think every person needs something that's that's appealing, that's beautiful, something to look at and feel awe about. To me, that is one of the key things about therapeutic horticulture, that we can be in awe and that we can leave behind for a moment all that's around us and that might weigh us down and that's difficult and just experience awe. And this is one thing I see all across our groups, no matter what. People who are in jail sometimes have to appear strong or put up their guard because they have to make their way through through these housing areas. It's not a friendly, supportive environment always, and they have to be able to take a stand and put up their guard and in a garden, we can leave that for a moment. We can um, just be excited together about the garden and feel all together. And that has been reflected to me by many people as a an incredibly important part, to be able to let their guard down for a moment and just be people in a garden together and take care for this land together. And so once that has happened, there's also ground for conversations that are different than the ones that are possible while inside. And maybe for an kind of an honest, open interaction with each other. So to me, this is one of the key 
elements. And another one could be that gardens give an opportunity to have agency over the space. So our participants all are able to choose what they grow in the growing season and really influence how these spaces look. And that means there is an element of creating something and to really have agency. I don't want to say control because the goal isn't to control nature, but agency as to how we partner with nature and how that can look. It must be incredibly empowering. What does a day look like for you at Rikers in your running your program? And then what might a day look like for a student? So for us, I, I do have a team on Rikers. I have instructors who are out there in our individual groups. And so we would arrive very early. We, we, our programs start early. They have to tie, they have to fit in between all other elements of life there, between count times and meal times and all of that. And so we start at 7.30 in our earliest groups. We have typically two groups a day, one in the earlier part and one in the later part. And each group would be um, three or three and a half hours. And so they they would start at 7.30 and then go for these blocks of time or start in the later part of the day for the same block of time. They are in different facilities. So when arriving there, we, the, the team, we need to move around to get to those facilities. And so there's always the element of even arriving. Already when we arrive, we have quite the route behind us. Mm -hmm. And then all our programs would look recognizable. They start with a brief check-in with each other. This is important. I think this is important for any therapeutic horticulture group, no matter where it is, um, to do a brief check-in and just see how people are because everybody comes from something that has happened earlier in the day or the evening before. And so we need to check in if people are okay and what might just have happened. And then we go over the plans for the day. And often these are just tied into the year-round cycle of gardens and nature. What does the garden look like? Is Do you have a greenhouse? Do you have an acre plot that you're growing stuff? Like what is the, what's the setup? There's various setups because with us having several groups, we also have several green spaces. The largest green space is about three acres big. It's a large spot. And that's also the wow. oldest garden. There we have a um, freestanding building, a classroom building, and a greenhouse that's attached to it, a large greenhouse where we grow our own seedlings. Right at this time of the year, it's full of seedlings. And we also have this really big outdoor space with raised beds for food production and then a native woodland, um, a pond and a, a slightly, yeah, an area that's themed around this water feature. We have a rose garden and then cut flower areas and we have guinea hens in this garden. So we have a little bit of wildlife and then we have smaller spaces that are within other buildings. One of the, currently we have two courtyard gardens that are within a building because these participants don't leave the facility to come to the program. They just walk through the facility and step out a door into this garden that's tied within a large program area. Um, so each setup looks different and we have a total of seven green spaces on Rikers different sizes and um, different access routes. All of them share that we grow food as well as ornamentals. And then a lot of it is based on sensory experience. So we always include plants that smell good, that respond to touch, that might rustle in the wind. So there's a lot of that to, to create real excitement about it. So Water features, we aim to have water features in all of the gardens, whether they are tiny or bigger. But we want all of these gardens to offer 
a similar experience to participants to see kind of a broad view on what could be in horticulture. And the food that you're growing on premises, is that going right to the cafeteria? Is that going to whoever's growing it? How does that work? Most of it is eaten by the groups themselves. So we end in the classroom. So we don't, people can't take this food with them to the housing areas, but we prepare it and eat it in the classrooms. And this is part of our curriculum to also talk about uh, nutrition, how to grow food, how to prepare it, we exchange recipes. This is really, really meaningful for students because it also allows for an exchange between cultures and different backgrounds and to mm. connect with family recipes people have and to share that and speak about it with each other. And it allows for meal community because in a correctional facility, Meals might go very quick and people don't always share. They, there's no opportunity to really sit down and share table, meal community. And we do that in the program. So we also make sure there's enough time for it. And we give credit for the people who made the food as well as for the people who grew it. And foster a meal community that allows for table conversation where we hear each other out. And so the topic of meal and food is big. We also collaborate with um, the Department of Education's uh, chefs. So very intentionally, we have a small program offshoot called Farm to Table, where we um, teach about specific foods or herbs, um, crops in the classrooms. And then our participants who also take part in the DOE cooking programs can utilize these um, things in their cooking class. And the chef works with us on picking that up and utilizing it and incorporating that aspect. So, And then we have, because we collaborate with the DOC, we have people who we invite to the garden and always share a little bit of the produce with and bring it off island also for our graduates who might want to share with their families what they grew while they were on the island. And so there's many different things we do with the food. Have you ever had a student of yours leave and then go into horticulture as a profession? Several. So because we have our workforce development program in the city as an option. I have seen many, many people choosing that option. And I have to say, when I first started with the program, I thought this is the overall goal. I measured success in seeing how many people would do that and would go from the island to choosing it as a profession and then working as horticulturists. And then I thought, okay, not that many people do that. Are we failing? And again, in a development that I had to, I had to learn a lot out there also, realized we are not failing if they don't go to that program. We are just offering many different things that can be done with the program afterwards. One of them being to make that a career. Others, there are other things people do with it, but one of them is to make that a career. And so, yes, I've seen many people going into our workforce development program and learning more about horticulture, especially if we have people with us who didn't complete a season because their time on Rikers is short. They would then learn so much more that we couldn't do. We also have limited uh, use of power tools out there. And so that's something participants would need to learn. And really, the difference between our gardens there and then city landscapes that people might encounter is something that's a huge field of horticulture that needs to be learned. So yes, when people come from Rikers and go into our workforce programs, I see that our program out there provided a great foundation. And then there's a lot more to learn. And people learn horticulture as well as also soft job skills. 
because we we work with many people who might not have a long work history yet. And so there's other things to learn, like being accountable and realizing everybody on the team matters and we have to be on time. And so there's many more aspects that then get learned in the community because they can't really be learned under those circumstances on Vikos. I was moved to know that you provide everyone with a reference letter when they leave the program so that, you know, they have proof of employment. I know that we have to protect identities, but you were able to share so many moving experiences that you've had in in class. Are there any like transformations, maybe even if they're common, so not from one person, but you kind of you've seen it multiple times of uh, clients and students who really have blossomed in the therapeutic horticultural program at Rikers? Yeah, thank you. There's so, so many. And I could say everybody does, including us. I really also think when we are there, staff and officers too are included in that. And I, I want to say that in a therapeutic horticulture program, to me, one of the big topics always has to be inclusiveness of every person who's there. So to me, it couldn't work by saying, I only work with the select group of people who are my participants and you others, you officers are excluded. A garden, a therapeutic horticulture program needs to be inclusive. And so these stories that you just mentioned go all across and they include all of us. And I see that, so if I think of students, yeah, many come to mind. I do want to say we have currently several people on our permanent staff, also in supervisory positions now, who come through the program on the island. And so it is a real career option and there's growth that, that people can choose and there's growth opportunities, which is a very... Wait, you're saying that they came as a person who was incarcerated, moved through your program left and then came back to work not on Rikers but to be hired with our workforce program at the horticultural society so these would be individuals who chose to continue their training outside and then discovered that horticulture really is a field that is exciting for them and where they can see themselves thriving and so they stayed with us and got hired as staff on the ward from a more intern position initially after coming from the island to a permanent staff position who now are also supervisors themselves. And can you explain what the Hort is? Sorry, we should have, I should have explained that in the beginning. Yeah. So the Horticultural Society of New York is an organization that's now a bit over 120 years old and initially started probably more as a social club with a horticulture theme and was um, geared towards bringing horticulture to New Yorkers through flower shows. And it was very different than now in its earlier years, probably more something for wealthier New Yorkers and more focused on education that's not necessarily inclusive had a library and it taught about horticulture and was more for a specific group within New York. And over the last 40 years, with the program on Rikers and the Workforce Development Program and also our school programs, we work in public schools and have a education greenhouse at Denny Farrell Riverbank State Park. And then over the last 20 years, with our growth in supportive housing, we shifted our focus. And so the Horticultural Society now is an organization that brings horticulture to all New Yorkers and, and aims to improve the life of anybody in New York through plants and plant activities. And... It's, yeah, it would be widespread. Many of the cityscapes would be maintained by our teams, by our workforce teams. So we would be visible all over the city as a training op 
facility as workforce development organization and also as a I'm shying a little bit away of the world of social service because it has a very the world has a very active role and so all our participants in all of these programs are actively beautifying the city and and create green spaces and work in in nearly all boroughs in parks and green spaces got it are there any other stories you might be able to share just as we kind of close out one story comes to mind of a person who prior to his stay on the island this was a person who's a veteran and prior to his stay on the island was unhoused and also had a long history of substance use and then on the island i remember the first maybe two weeks i didn't see much buy in or interest and then it changed and this was at the beginning of the growing season and we had planted our tomatoes outside and then this person started to be very very excited about the tomatoes as also something that he liked to eat and i think combined with the exciting names these tomato plants had and looking in the seed catalogs what to be expected when what there were so many plants they all looked the same or similar but so many potential different outcomes and so he turned into our tomato person and began really taking care for these tomatoes and thinking through what needs to be done for these tomatoes and until his departure to care for them including pest management and we this is tomato hornworm season we had hornworms that he calls his nemesis and <laughs> he became the tomato man and to me seeing something like that really shows very much about the potential nature has and plants can have because this person all of a sudden had something to look forward to on a day-to-day -day basis that's very powerful to think okay this was today and then what happens tomorrow what need what do i need to think about tomorrow maybe tomorrow i need to fertilize so all of that would be important and then also to take joy in this and to take responsibility for somebody who might have been at the margins for a long time and maybe people didn't even notice him when they walked by him on the street and now he had he took responsibility he embraced it and he spoke about it and got compliments for it and so these are this was a uh, one example that i will always always remember or also the story of a a young woman who also had a long story of of substance use and felt very reluctant to take care for herself and to go into a program and maybe make a big decisions that were necessary for her in life and so she was part of the horticulture program for quite a while and there too i i saw that it was maybe a slower start of investment and she was with us for quite a while and then i clearly remember as harvesting cucumbers and preparing these cucumbers we made a salad with them and it was a simple cucumber salad but when she came back the next day she said i thought about something i told my daughter about these cucumbers and the cucumber salad and i thought if i can get that excited about a cucumber what else could there be in life that gets me so excited and that i want to learn about and what changes do i need to make for that and so this too was feedback that i could not have anticipated clearly the situation with the cucumber came about by chance i didn't plan that we all didn't plan that and yet when the time is there and this is something i observe a lot in our programs when the time is right our participants have such moment like i had my aha moment with horticultural therapy people might have such moments and and you're not you're never sure what exactly is going to be the trigger yes exactly you just have to keep showing up they have to show up 
and just kind of let it unfold in its, you know, for lack of a better word, natural rhythm. Yes. This is so inspiring. I'm so thankful for the classes that I've taken, especially for your class. If people are interested in exploring horticultural therapy for themselves, are there books that you would recommend maybe reading? Obviously, we're going to recommend the New York Botanical Garden course and there's multiple courses and a full certification. You can go get, you know, a certification in this practice. What classes do you teach at NYBG? I teach therapeutic horticulture for mental health. That's currently the only one I teach. And then we also are about to reopen our internship opportunity. We for a long time had internships for students from NYBG and also from from other schools and but we provided internships and for a long time due to COVID this was paused and I think by fall later fall we are able to open these internship opportunities back up in a bigger arena than we did before not just on Rikers but also in our supportive housing programs and probably school programs for people who would like to step into therapeutic horticulture. When I think about what I recommend to read, I think uh, Sue Stewart-Smith's book, The Well Garden Mind, is something I would so good. recommend. I-, I interviewed her on my show. Okay. She's amazing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I think that's a really amazing book to learn much about plants and nature and what can be happening inside. Yeah, I think therapeutic horticulture gets to welcome us on all levels of our being. Anyone listening who hasn't read The Well Garden Mind yet, she I had her on my show in 2021, but she's a psychiatrist and a lifelong gardener. And so the way that she can break down the studies that prove the plant-person connection, but then also speak personally to her experience, and the book is just like so thoroughly researched, it's a great read, If definitely if you're interested in this. I think that one would be one. And then I used the book Horticultural Therapy Methods by Halle and Capra, which to me is a book that I I continue to utilize a lot because it's so hands-on. It has so many, um, and there are many more books. I'm just now speaking, and very, very good books. I'm now just speaking the two I probably use most in my practice and that I also give to all incoming staff that comes on my team because I think there's the more reflective side from Sue Stuart Smith book that I really want want everyone to understand and then the very hands on book that speaks on strategies and you had earlier in the interview mentioned these almost prescription form topics. Yeah. That's from that book. Like as our and, and this book has many other um clear explanations in it and to me that's helpful because it brought therapeutic horticulture from a slightly abstract thing to a very concrete thing that can be learned. And I think it can be learned. It's not something where we stand in a garden and have some magic potion. We are in a garden, we have tools, and we can learn these tools. And so that's something I would encourage everyone to to see if we are passionate about it and are able to see other people and be passionate about bringing horticulture to other people we can learn these these skills and it's it's not a well-kept secret it's something that needs people to come in and utilize that and share that absolutely well i can't recommend your class enough at nybg and those books we'll make sure that everything's in the show notes you can go to nybg.org and then just click on the education section they have so many amazing educational programs are you on social media yeah like can people follow you publicly okay so uh where can people follow you specifically hilda if they're inspired i'm very limited on social media i was just about to say the horticultural society is on social media okay. and really informs about all of the many programs we are doing so under the hoard anybody could find us and i can also send this through to you my social i have to say i'm a this is terrible to say in this day and age i'm 
not a great social media person. I'm more an in-person soil person and I need to improve that. I know that. So I'll send, now you see me flustered because I don't even know my exact social media name, but I will send it to you. <laughs> we can include the Hort social media too, no stress. Thank you so much for having me in your class and for being such a, a wonderful, beautiful teacher. I really cherish everything that I learned in your class and I cherish everything you shared today. It's been so interesting and inspiring to learn about that program and your journey. And I hope that there's many more budding horticultural therapists in the listener community to get certified soon. Thank you so much. This was such a pleasure. It was wonderful, Maria, to meet you in this class. And yes, I think the whole therapy, the therapeutic horticulture classes are also a great way to get to know each other and get to know this community. And right now we are ending whole therapy week. This is the last day of whole therapy week. So I'm very excited that our interview fell into this week. And last week, Sunday, we had a meeting at the New York Botanical Garden by the Mid-Atlantic Networking Group with so many students from your course and other courses. And it became clear that the classes at NYBG really are a starting point for so many going into this field and then building community and sharing with each other. And that's maybe... One thing I would love to say at the end, this is a profession that, like a garden, a profession that shares and lives of people who come in and are excited about it and then also spread the world. And so, Maria, I thank you for giving me this opportunity. This was such a pleasure. Thank you very much. Such a pleasure. And yes, I will say all the women in our class were special ladies. It definitely attracts a very kind, creative, sweet soul to the profession. So thank you. Thank you, Hilda, for this talk. She really gave so much insight into the program. This field of therapeutic horticulture slash horticultural therapy, however you want to call it, is so interesting and so powerful. And I really feel like it could be the future. <laughs> Not the future like no more medicine, but wouldn't it be amazing if it was supplemental, you know? In Japan, you will get a prescription to go forest bathing, right? And wouldn't it be amazing if in the States we start getting prescriptions for therapeutic horticulture? I think that could be pretty amazing. And if you're interested in, you know, some of these practices, you can totally grab my book. It's called Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness. I talk about horticultural therapy. I talk about a lot of the different studies that horticultural therapy are backed on and different practices, but also take a class at New York Botanical Garden. Their educators are some of the best in the world. I've never taken a class I didn't like. I think at this point I've taken like six. If you're interested in the certificate program, I've left the link in the show notes for you to click and explore. But basically, you go to nybg.org slash learn, then click adult education, then click certificate program, and then the therapeutic horticultural program will be there. They have a couple of required courses coming up if you're interested, the fundamentals of gardening and intro to plant science. I've taken both those classes, love them both, really loved intro to plant science. You learn so much. And in general, New York Botanical Garden just has like so many amazing classes and even just like little lectures and webinars that are one-offs. So definitely go check them out and we'll leave all of the links that you need in the show notes. So on the heels of this conversation about therapeutic horticulture, I hope you can take a minute and make a commitment to yourself for how you might use plants as a wellness tool this week, whether that's, you know, creating a plant care self-care routine where you're watering or you're taking care of your plants every day, but you're using that as reflective space. So you're not on your phone. You're like giving yourself some time with plants. Maybe you're going for a walk in the woods nearby. Maybe you're grounding, putting your feet on the bare ground and connecting with the earth's energy. Maybe you're saying planty affirmations to your plants or yourself. Like you grow a little plant. There's a myriad of ways to apply this practice people can go get certified in, but there's ways to use plants as wellness tools that can be very accessible and easy to you. So with that, my plant friends, go engage with your plants in a mindful way this week. And until next time, keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. 
And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast. So I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. First, there's the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your Plant Parent Personality profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to green up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. You can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Growing Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group, so if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section, plus the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar, and literally every post ever created about Hoya will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. 
After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. (music) 